Very good evening to you all, wherever you are, or if you're in the United States, good afternoon. Or if you're in mainland Europe, definitely good evening or good night. And if you're anywhere else, well, Australia, for instance, it's the early hours of the morning there. Welcome to Live Irish Myths, episode number nine. Can you believe that we are at that stage already? So I started this series as a, a distraction and a form of entertainment, I suppose, and education. For those of you who are perhaps housebound or working from home or, you know, restricted in some way by the coronavirus outbreak. And to try and just to lift people's spirits, I believe mythology is a very good way of doing that. And I believe that for many generations in the past, uh, myths and stories were central to human life and to uh, uh, human uh, mental and spiritual health. Today, uh, the focus of today's episode is a myth very closely associated with the great monument of Siedembroga, Sionvru Newgrange, uh, which is just, uh, I might remind you, 4.1 miles in that direction. If you were to be able to, be able to magically fly through my bookshelf there uh, and fly across the sky, uh, you'd get to Newgrange uh, after a distance of 4.1 miles. Uh, and so um, there are different stories about Newgrange. Actually, Newgrange features in many uh, myths and stories uh, of different ages. Hang on till I just disabled the PC so we don't get any noisy interruptions. Um, and this is one of my favourites. I wrote about this in Island of the Setting Sun in search of Ireland's ancient astronomers with Richard Moore, which is originally published in 2006, reprinted in 2008. And hopefully, all going well, uh, there will be a 2020 commemorative uh, edition. Uh, due to be released in May, must have a, another conversation with my publisher as to how that stands, but fingers crossed that that will be okay. Red Moonhead is watching. Hello, Red. Vicky Highlands. Uh, yes, if one good thing ever comes out of this, it's that I can catch your lives. Oh, yeah, you mean the live broadcast. Yeah, very good. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're enjoying it. And, you know, it's a distraction and a very welcome one for me because it's helping me also. I have to prepare for these things and it's just uh, helping to keep my mind off things. Uh, so for those of you who are maybe not familiar with Newgrange, Diane Hedden says, finally got to be here for the live broadcast. Glad you made it. You might tell us where in the world you are, Diane. And I hope it's not a crazy hour of the morning or the night time where you are. Um, Newgrange is part of the great complex of Brunebonia uh, in the Boyne Valley here in Ireland, very close to me here. It is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, the monuments, the great passage mounds or chambered cairns or passage tombs, the great she of Newgrange and Nouth and Douth uh, were built over 5,000 years ago and are among the largest and finest Stone Age ruins anywhere in the world. Cathy is saying hello from Florida. Hello Cathy and I hope all is well with you. Um, Newgrange was excavated by Professor Michael O'Kelly starting in 1962 and winding up in the late 70s. Now big excavations under the direction of Professor George Ogan also began in 1962 and continued for four decades, the results of which are contained in great tomes still being released. And I have uh, volumes five and six, which are massive uh, uh, doorstep volumes. I mean, we're talking about, you know, huge volumes. Uh, uh, a, a wonderful record of, of these sites uh, and uh, volume seven due to be published next year i'm hearing diane says she's in lake elsinore in california well good evening or good morning i think it is in california good morning to you uh maggie is in maryland hello maggie very nice of you to join us today and linda lowe is in alberta in canada so a big transatlantic contingent today hope you're all well i hope you're all managing through the crisis and fingers crossed uh, a solution will be found treatments uh, uh, vaccine uh, and that it will start to abate sometime soon fingers crossed the story known 
as Ashlinger Angusow, the vision or dream of Angus, one could also say the dream vision of Angus, was first mentioned mentioned as a Rem Scala, i.e. an introductory tale to the Toynbo Cúilinge, that is the Catarate of Cooley, in the 12th century Book of Leinster, but is not recounted there. It's mentioned in the Book of Leinster, but the story is not told there. Now remember that all of the myths, uh, uh, all of the myths in manuscripts were written down by monks, Christian monks, who preserved pre-Christian pagan mythology of Ireland in the in the um, in the monasteries from the 11th to the 16th centuries AD. Kristen Taggart is in California. Glad I can tune into the live broadcast today. Well, I'm glad to have you along, Chris, Kristen, and hopefully you'll enjoy it. And hopefully you're keeping well and keeping your spirits up. Carol Barrett. Hey, Equinox from Galway. I'm really enjoying your videos. Thanks. Hello, Carol. Thank you very much for that. And happy Spring Equinox to you all. We had a long discussion about Spring Equinox yesterday, and we may just get back to it briefly this evening before the end of the webcast. Caitlin says, this is arguably the only happy story in Irish mythology. Mm. Yeah. I can't immediately challenge you on that. The story is contained, that is, Ashley Angusso, is contained in full in a British Library Egerton manuscript, that is, 70B, dating from AD 1517. Uh, Marie Hughes says, our beautiful daughter has this birthday, first day of spring, a very happy birthday to your daughter, Marie. Hope she is having a good day. A translation by Edward Muller was published in Revue Celtique in the 1870s. This translation uses somewhat archaic English, so I decided to update it for a more modern audience. Note that it is not always implicit from the dialogue who is speaking, so I have had to use some judgment in a couple of instances. Any errors are, of course, mine. I should also mention that the past couple of days here in Ireland have been very bright and sunny. It's, I mean, it's not warm, warm, but it's nice and dry, and I think it's about 10 degrees Celsius outside. I've decided to leave the curtains open and the blind up to let natural light in, uh, because at the moment, I think people need that. More than ever, they need light, and it's certainly helping in the current situation. Angus was sleeping one night when he saw something like a maiden near him at the top of his bed. She was the most beautiful woman in Ireland. Angus tried to take her by the hands to bring her into his bed, but she suddenly vanished. His mind was uneasy until the morning. Catherine Wall McManus is saying happy spring equinox from Navan. And of course, Navan is also on the Boyne River, a distance of about 14, 13 or 14 miles west of us here. A very good afternoon to you, Catherine. I hope you're keeping safe and well. The episode brought an illness upon him. This vision of a figure he had seen, but with whom he hadn't spoken. He did not eat any food. The next night he saw her again, this time with a symbol in her hand. She played a song to him so that he fell asleep. He was there until morning. He did not have any breakfast. M Marie Hughes, thank you, Anthony. You're a fine light in this crazy time. I'm doing my best. I'm putting the good, uh, the good side out, as the man says. A whole year passed by and she continued to visit him in his bed so that he fell in love. He didn't tell anybody about this mysterious maiden. He fell ill and nobody knew what was wrong with him. The physicians of Erin assembled. They did not know what was wrong. One went to Fergna, the physician of Con. He came to Angus. He knew from looking at Angus's face what was wrong with him. He had an illness of the mind. Fergna spoke with Angus and told him that, quote, accidental love has fallen on you, unquote. My illness has judged me, said Angus. I loved in heartlessness and nobody dared to to say it to the other. David Gilroy is watching. Hello, David, you're very welcome. 
It is true, said Angus, I met a beautiful woman, the most beautiful that is in Erin, with a distinguished appearance. She had a symbol in her hand on which she used to play to me every night. Fergna knew that love sickness had seized Angus, so he went to fetch the young man's mother, Boan, to come and speak with him. I was trying to cure this man, said Fergna, who has been seized by an uncertain illness. Fergna asked Boan to search the whole of Ireland for a maiden like that, which her son had seen at night. And so Boan searched Ireland for a year, but nothing was found. Fergna was called for again. We have not found any help in this matter, said Boan. Fergna said, send for the Dagda, so that he may come and speak with his son. Dagda came. Why have I been called here, he asked. To help your son, said Boan, or Boan, as it's spelt here, the alternative spelling. Your help is better for him. It would be a pity for him to die. He has an illness. He has fallen in an accidental love and there is no help for him. What use is it to, to him to speak with me, uh, said the Dagda. My knowledge is no better than yours. Fergna said to the Dagda that he was the fairy king of Erin, and he implored Dagda to send to the fairy king of Munster, Bub, whose knowledge was known far and wide. And I think that that translation, fairy king, is a, a, a mistranslation because the fairies, of course, are a much later Victorian uh, translation of the term she uh, and in relation to the two Adadan and deities. So they went to Bub, who was asked, or Bov, if you put the H in, who asked why they had come. Angus, the son of the Dagda, is in love this past two years, said Fergna. What for, said Bov. He saw a maiden in his dreams. We don't know anywhere in Ireland that this maiden can be found. Bob was asked to search Ireland for a woman of this form and appearance. Bob agreed and said it would take him a year until he could answer with certainty. So all this uh, repetition of the year, that there's a, something here connected with the, the year and the return of the year. Fergna went at the end of a year back to the house of Bob at Shear Femin. I have investigated all Aaron, said Bob until I found the maiden at Luck Bel Dracon at the Harp of Cleach. The two went to Dagda with the good news. The maiden has been found, said Fergna. Now Bob insists that Angus is to come with us in order to ascertain whether he recognises her as the maiden he saw in his dreams. Angus was brought in a chariot to Shear Femin. A great feast was held with King Bob for three days and nights. There's that three days and nights, always three days and nights. Afterwards, Bob reckon, beckoned Angus outside to see if he recognised the woman. They travelled until they were at sea, where they saw 150 young women and the maiden was among them. A silvery chain linked every two of the woman, a silvery necklace around the neck, and a chain of burnished gold. Do you recognise the maiden? Bob asked. Of course I recognised her, replied Angus. This is not your greatest power, said Bob. Not so, replied Angus, for I will not be able to take her with me this time. Who is the maiden? Oh, Bob asked Angus. I know who she is. She is Caer Ibermay. Daughter, daughter of Ethel Anbual from Shi Owen in the province of Connacht. Angus returned with Bob, Bob to Brug, Brug Macindog, which is the name of Newgrange after Angus took it over from the Dagda, to visit the Dagda and Boan. They related how they had seen the maiden and had heard the name of her father and grandfather. Bob suggested to the Dagda that he should go to Eilil and Mabe in their territory in the land of Connacht where the maiden was located. The Dagda travelled with 60 chariots to Connacht. The king and queen welcomed him. They had a feast and drank beer for a whole week. That's a typical Irish party. Yes, nothing less than a week's, week's drinking will do. The king asked Dagda what was the reason for his journey. There is a maiden in your land, said the Dagda, and my son is in love with her 
and an illness has seized him. I come to ask if you could give her to my son. Which woman is she? asked Eilil. The daughter of Ethel Anbual. We have no power over her, said Eilil and Maeve, that we could give her to him. Let the king be called here, said the Dagda. The steward of Eilil went to Ethel Anbual and told him that he was to go to speak with Eilil and Maeve. I will not go, he said. I will not give my daughter to the son of the Dagda. Ethel Anbual's answer was related to Eilil. He will not come. He knows the reason for which he is called. Not so, said Eilil. I will go and my soldiers will be taken to him. Then the household of Eilil and the army of the Dagda rose up towards the fairies. They destroyed the whole she. They went to the king who was in the caves of anxiety. <laughs> Eilil, a little bit like some of us at the moment in the caves of anxiety. Vicky Wallace Southall is saying hello from Oregon. A very good... I reckon it's 11 a.m. there, six, seven hours. Yeah, is that right? 11 a.m. Vicky, good morning to you. It's uh, it's 6 p.m. well, after six in the evening here. Eilil said to Ethel Anbual, give your daughter to the son of the Dagda. I cannot, he said. There is a greater power in them. What greater power? asked Eilil. Not difficult to say, replied Ethel Anbual. And Vicky is saying it's actually 10.15 a.m. There you go. I got it wrong. It's actually eight hours. Uh, no, no, no. Hang on. It's quarter past five. Yeah, I'm looking at the wrong clock. Yes, of course. Apologies. That's just me being silly. The clock is timed here. It says 18.16, but it's actually only 5.16. So that's right. Thank you for setting me right, Vicky. And you're the one that's just uh, in morning time. It looks sounds like I haven't had coffee. Not difficult to say, replied Ethel Anbual, to be in the shape of a bird every day of a year and the other year to be in human shape. Which year will she be in the shape of a bird, said Eilil. I don't know, said Kerr's father. <laughs> Vicky is laughing. I know, I'm embarrassed. Sorry. Eilil threatened to cut his head off if he did not explain. So he did. She will be in the shape of a bird the next summer, at Luck Bell Dracon, and beautiful birds will be seen with her, and there will be 150 swans around her, or as it's given uh, or in the original uh, story, thrice 50. It's, ne it's never 150, it's always given as uh, thrice 50. Afterwards, Eilil, Ethel and the Dagda became good friends, and Ethel was sent free. Well, thank goodness for that. The Dagda went to his house and told the news to his son. Next summer, you must go to Luck Bell Dracon and call to call her to you at the lake. Mac Og went to the Luck Bell Dracon when he saw the 150 white birds at the lake with their silvery chains and golden caps around their heads. Angus was in human shape at the edge of the lake. He called the maiden to him. Come to speak with me, O Care. Who calls me, said Care. Angus calls you. Come and yield to me. I will come, she said. I, I, I would say that's a rather uh, Victorian English translation. Come and yield to me is probably just more simple than that. Come to me. I will come. You know, you see the way that the, uh, the female is subservient to the male in this. Uh, that's probably just the translation. I will come, she said. She went over to him. He put his two hands on her. They slept in the shape of two swans until they surrounded the lake three times. They left the lake in the form of two white birds until they were at the brug of the Mackindog, that is Newgrange, and they made sweet music so that the people fell asleep for three days and three nights. The, ma the maiden care remained with Angus at the brew after that, and afterwards Angus became good friends with Eilil and Maeve, and as a consequence, Angus went with 300 others to Eilil and Maeve for the Toynbo Kulga. There you go. And thus, two threads of mythology, the, uh, uh, the mythological cycle, 
pertaining to the original deities and the Lower Gawala, etc., etc., is linked up with the much later Thornbow Kulnge by suggesting that as a as a, a repayment for their help in this matter of his mysterious dream maiden, uh, Angus repaid Eilil and Maeve uh, with uh, uh, warriors or soldiers during Thornbow Kulnge. Now, an exploration of the story of uh, uh, Ashlinga Angusow reveals something very interesting in relation to Newgrange. And I'm happy to read a little bit of this from the book uh, Island of the Setting Sun, uh, which I think you will find interesting with regards to its association, the association of the... Um, the story with the monument, uh, how it might describe some of the cosmology slash astronomy associated with that monument uh, and even the design of it. Newgrange is a very important wintering ground for the Whooper Swan, Cygnus Cygnus, and probably the only site in County Meath holding a flock of these birds on a regular basis each winter. The Whoopers come to Ireland from Iceland, landing first at Donegal and then dispersing to their various wintering grounds around Ireland. This makes them a particularly difficult species to census. Their increased use of agricultural habitats not necessarily immediate adjacent to wetland habitats is part of the reason for this. Things become even more difficult in wet years when birds become even more dispersed. Ornithologists say all the whoopers which visit Ireland are from the breeding population in Iceland. The size of the winter population here has in recent years been estimated to be between 14,000 and 16,000 birds. Now remember this was uh, uh, published in 2006. Those numbers uh, may have gone up or down since then. The Whooper Swan population was first officially recorded at Newgrange in the winter of 1966-67. to but both whoopers and Buick's swans were recorded feeding on large open meadows and bogs in County Meath in the last century. Uh, sorry, as in the 19th century. The flock at Newgrange varies in size from year to year, ranging from as few as 30 birds to as many as 226, the highest number ever recorded at the site in the winter of 1987 to 88. However, it is not known how long the birds have been coming to Ireland as statistics are unavailable for the preceding centuries. And uh, of course, that's not surprising. Uh, people did not r r read and write uh, prior to the famine to any great extent, and they certainly didn't uh, take swan census censuses. What can be said for certain is that Newgrange is a nationally important wintering ground for whoopers. During the five-year period from 1984 to 89, the average number of whooper swans at Newgrange was over the threshold of 105 to qualify the site as being of national importance. We wondered if it was possible that swans have been coming to Newgrange since ancient times and whether that was the part of the inspiration for the swan myths. Tales such as the swan chase from Armagh, that is the one involving uh, Dechtene uh, and how she uh, comes to... Uh, um, <clears throat> um, encounter Lou at uh, Newgrange and how the child Satanta is conceived. And the romance of Angus and Care, which we've just been reading, Ashlinga Angus establish a firm mythical connection between swans and Newgrange. In the case of the latter story, there are wider associations with the heavens and the monument that must be explored in further detail. It is in this text called Ashlinga Angus that we read the dramatic and romantic swan story. And the story briefly is, as we've said, that uh, Angus fell madly in love with a maiden who visited him while he slept. She appeared to him in his dreams for a year and all this time he could not touch her because she would disappear. And he becomes sick with love. Uh, eventually, uh, they need to call in the expertise of Bob, Bob or Bove uh, from Shear she 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 Famine. And uh, uh, Bove finds her. Uh, at Luck Bale Dracon, which is translated as the Lake of the Dragon's Mouth, the following Samhain, uh, which is in November. Angus went to the lake and found care in the form of a swan. I'm just skipping through this because I don't want to repeat the whole story. And found care in the form of a swan, in accompanied by thrice fifty swans, all linked together by a silver chain. Care herself was said to have worn a silver necklace. When Angus went to care, he was 
transformed into a swan. They embraced each other, flew three times around the lake and then flew together to Brunabonia and put the dwellers of that place to sleep with their beautiful singing. Care remained with Angus in the brew after that. So here we had an ancient story relating directly to swans and to Newgrange. The fact that Care was from an otherworld residence was intriguing, given that we had already established firm mythological evidence that the otherworld in some instances was located in the sky among the stars. It is interesting also that there is a constellation or grouping of stars in the sky which is known as Cygnus the Swan. This constellation has its supposed origins in the classical world, representing the Greek god Zeus, who has taken on the guise of a swan, flying across the sky, quote, to pay an illicit visit to Leda, wife of King <coughs> Tyndareus of Sparta. I'm sorry, I didn't know how to pronounce that. Is it possible that the ancient Irish classified Cygnus as a swan, albeit under a different name? long before the Greeks. We think so. <coughs> and, and thus begins what we refer to as uh, the Cygnus Enigma. Catherine is wondering, did Swan Lake come from this story? I think that this story has similarities to other stories told in Indo-European Indo myths. Um, and of course, the swan is uh, a creature that features uh, quite often, not just in Irish mythology, but in European mythology. Fix my glasses. Barry Cunliffe, professor of European archaeology at Oxford University, believes that the ancient people of Ireland and Britain were far more advanced than any of the ancient early Mediterranean cultures. And that our view of the Stone Age in the British Isles had been skew skewed by our historical reliance on the Greek and Roman classical texts, which were thick with prejudice and ignorant of almost anything beyond the pillars of Hercules, Gibraltar. Cunliffe said that for all these years we've been looking at Europe the wrong way around, and the idea that civilization flowed out from the Mediterranean out to the barbarian edges of Europe has clouded our view that it flowed the other way too. Furthermore, he said, there had been a belief up until three decades ago that Newgrange and the great megalithic monuments were influenced from the Mediterranean cultures, but that the evidence from carbon dating had shown that these buildings were being constructed here long before they began to appear in Southern Europe. I'm just making sure I haven't missed anything. Uh, Kristen Taggart says it seems to me that there are some aspects of the Cinderella fairy tale a woman who flees from the man by night transforming into something else and the man has to try to recognise her among many others very interesting point Kristen thank you for pointing that out and Catherine says thanks yeah I need to do more research on that point Catherine actually but thank you for it British writer and Earth Mysteries researcher Andrew Collins, the author of six books, including the Cygnus Mystery, believes the Swan constellation was hugely important to many ancient cultures. He reports that Dr. Michael Rappengluck, Rappengluck G L U Umlaut C K, I'm not how sure how to pronounce that, please forgive me, of Munich University, concluded that Cygnus, along with neighbouring constellations Lyra and Aquila, were represented in an ancient star map in the world-famous Lascaux Caves in France, dating back to 16,500 years ago. Maria Mann is saying, Anthony, could you please talk sometime about the High Man? Absolutely, it would be my pleasure to, Maria. And just so that I don't lose track of it, I am keeping a list of suggestions for episodes, and I'm going to add that in, uh, the High Man, and that's suggested by Maria Mann. Thank you, Marie. I'm not sure if you've made some of the other suggestions on the list, but if that's your first, I thank you for it. Yep, we will we'll certainly discuss that. Very interesting. A little bit far out for some people, but 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 we will get to it. All of this leads us to wonder if perhaps some of the constellations were first envisaged on the periphery of Europe and later these shapes migrated into the classical world. The Atlantic societies, according to Barry Cunliffe, were far more advanced in their navigation, their solar knowledge and their knowledge of the seasons and the stars. If this, and of course we've discussed this, haven't we, about the navigation of the rivers and the seas by the people of the Neolithic and the evidence, some evidence for that in the mythology. 
especially the the root way that the boyne seems to have provided first of all in the original creation myths but then the root way for the in what we call the invasions or the arrivals our geen, uh uh, Glungial, who comes in as the spiritual leader of the Milesians and lands in the Boyne estuary, and St. Patrick, uh, of course, a couple of days ago, a few days ago, who we mentioned, uh, landed in the same place in the Boyne. Brendan Kinch says, I would also be interested in more on the high man. Well, there you go. There's a discussion, uh, absolutely, that we are going to have sooner rather than later, because to be honest, with some of these subjects, I'm going to have to do research. The ones that rely more on work that I have already written and done uh, are easier for me to discuss at this point. If the Swan constellation was visualised by the megalithic builders of Ireland, the evidence of this would surely be greater than a few old stories about swans. This led us to examine further connections and to form a theory which we came to call the Cygnus Enigma. It is our belief that the layout and passage and chamber of Newgrange was influenced by the shape of the Cygnus constellation and that this can be fur further inferred from the Angus Care Love myth which specified that they went into Newgrange after taking the, the form of swans. The chamber structure being cross-shaped reflects the cruciform figure of the swan star grouping which as we will see was an especially important constellation which held a very special significance at the time Newgrange was built. Katie McMahon says, love your live chats. Uh, thank you, Katie. Very glad that you're enjoying them. It is one of a number of such cross-shaped passages known in Irish passage grave architecture. A preference for cross-shaped tombs was a pronounced insular trait of the Boyne Passage Mound builders, although examples uh, are found on the European continent also. At Newgrange, though, something very out of the ordinary confirms a very reach, far-reaching aspect of the complexity of its design. It is a little-known fact that the Newgrange, sorry, that the passage of Newgrange points in the direction of another group of ancient monuments on the hill of Four Knocks, just inside the Meath Dublin border. That is on the Meath side, near a village called Knoll, about fifteen kilometres south southeast of Newgrange. I should also mention that uh, the closest village to Fornox is actually Clonalvi, Cluan Alva, the meadow of Alva. While the chamber actually aligns to a point in the sky where the sun appears over Red Mountain on winter solstice, the range of azimuths covered by the chamber structure is between four and five degrees wide. In other words, you know, allowing for that 17 minute uh, uh, period during which the sun shines into Newgrange, that it appears first in the roof box before it exits on the other side. The old habit of drawing lines on maps came into play again when we realised very early on in our research, that's myself and Richard Moore, that a small passage tomb at Fornox lay roughly in the direction of winter solstice viewed from Newgrange, although neither site is visible from the other because of intervening hills. Wondering what significance Fornox held in the scheme of things, we went up there to have a look. Now Fornox is a lot smaller than Newgrange, uh, although it is very closely connected with the Boyne uh, architecture, the tombs, the she, if you want to call them. It was excavated in the early 1950s, actually 1951, by P.J. Hartnett, who found that it contained a large pear-shaped chamber measuring 7.5 metres at its widest point. This chamber has three side recesses, or, or chambers, and 12 of the structural stones at Four Knox are decorated with intricate petroglyphs. Today it is topped with a shell concrete dome, although there is no clear evidence that Fornox had a complete roof on it when it was in use. Now I'm just going to skip a little bit because I want to keep on the story. Two things which we perceived as immediate connections linking Fornox with Newgrange were the cruciform shape that appears to have inspired both chambers, the squashed oval shape which was inherent in both of the outline of the Newgrange cairn and the composition of the chamber of Fornox. This shape brings to mind the primordial cosmic egg of Site Q or the Douthenge which we met in chapter 5. At Newgrange, this egg is pierced or split open by the rays of the winter solstice sun. And there's something I forgot to mention when we were discussing uh, the Dagda, uh, you know, uh, the idea that Newgrange is an egg because we spoke about it being organic and it being a womb and it being feminine. What we what we what I for had forgotten to mention is the idea of the egg being pierced. 
And at that moment, the union of, of, of male sun shaft and female earth mound inspires the notion that an act of conception leading to the birth of the new sun for the year was taking place symbolically. It is possible, according to one author, that the goal of astral rituals was to magically influence events so as to improve survival and fertility. At Fornox, unlike Newgrange, the sun cannot shine down its passage and into the dark chamber. The stark reason for that is that the aperture of the chamber opens towards a point on the horizon which is too far north to accept light from the rising sun. And there's an overlay of uh, uh, Fornox and the Great uh, Douthenge, a, a map of the Great Douthenge. And you'll see that the egg-shaped chamber matches the shape of the henge. But you'll also see like north is up in this image. So the, the passage actually points very slightly east of north, far too north to where the summer solstice sun would rise in the northeast. So the sun never shines into the chamber of Fornox through the passageway. In fact, due to the fact that the Axis of the chamber's alignment points roughly towards 14 degrees of azimuth, that is slightly east of north. The interior structure of Fornox cannot even accept light from the rising moon at the major standstill, which would be located a whole 19 degrees further east along the horizon, the equivalent of about 38 moon widths away. What is particularly notable about the orientation of the Fornox passage is that it would appear to a point fairly accurately, sorry, to point fairly accurately in the direction of the Baltray standing stones, which we met in chapter one. In fact, I have uh, examined that alignment in my book, Mythical Ireland, New Light on the Ancient Past, and it is astonishingly, astonishingly accurate. And I'm going to skip a little bit. I need to skip because I need to keep, keep on, on, on story today, on point. So what in the heavens, if anything, did Fornox point to? And this was a big question in the research for Island of the Setting Sun. Did anything actually rise so close to due north? Therein lies the central cornerstone of the Cygnus Enigma. It is not known exactly when Fornox was built, but ar archaeologists say it was probably in the time period 3000 to 2500 BC. And in fact, it's mo most likely because it, it, it's connected with the Boyne culture to have been built in the earlier part of that epoch and perhaps a little bit before 3000 BC. It is to this epoch we returned to recreate the ancient sky using computer software. With our view centred on 14 degrees, we watched the stars pass by as we progressed through time using, the, using 15 minute intervals. The first time Richard and I did this, we were struck with a startling sight. Deneb, the bright primary star of Cygnus, the heavenly swan, came into view as it began to rise off the northern horizon. Moving back and forth using SkyMap's time skip feature, that's the program we were using at the time. <laughs> it's amazing how, 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 how far things have come. Uh, if, if you're interested in astronomical uh, software to look at uh, uh, a simulation of the night sky at any time, uh, Stellarium is very good and it's free. It became apparent in that moment that the swan constellation of the sky may have held a special significance to the Stone Age astronomers. What was not immediately important to us at that moment was what exact importance Cygnus held. We could see in the piece, we could, okay, never mind, we'll, we'll, we'll skip. So this, thus far, this was the picture. Swan mythology was central to the story of Newgrange. The fields in front of Newgrange are and were an important wintering ground for swans. The passage of Newgrange points towards Fornox. And of course is cross-shaped like the swan constellation. Fornox points to a place on the horizon where Deneb, the swan star, would have been rising after skimming the horizon five millennia ago. But it's deeper than this. Both Newgrange and Fornox have chamber structures which are based upon the cross shape, echoing the cruciform outline of the swan constellation. A comparison of the ground plan of Newgrange with Cygnus is interesting because, even though the two don't make an exact fit, the Newgrange pass passage is sinuous with a kink which helps narrow the solstice sunbeam, but which also serves as a reflection of the heavenly bird uh, because its axis is also crooked. So they're both cruciform in design. Um, Andrew Collins mentions other famous sites in Britain that might have been inspired by the Swan constellation, including the massive Avebury complex and the megalithic stone circle at Callanish on the Isle of Lewis in the Scottish Outer Hebrides. 
Colin suggests that the North Avenue of Callanish uh, has the appearance of an elongated Celtic cross. Sorry, that's not the full quote. That the North Avenue of Callanish, which has a multi-linear arrangement of stones, giving it the appearance of an elongated Celtic cross, pointed out the rising place of Sadr, the star marking the centre of the cross of the sky between 3000 and 2000 BC. At Avebury, just like at Newgrange, migrating colonies of swans gathered each winter in the vicinity of the water-filled moat that encircled Silbury Hill, and also at nearby Winterburn and Kennet Rivers, which form part of Avebury's ritual landscape. Of significance is also the fact that Newgrange and Fornox, as mentioned, have as an integral element of their design the shape of an egg, the symbol of fertilisation, of reproduction, of new birth. We are reminded of the fact that the primordial cosmic egg has its roots in much more ancient times and is connected with symbolism which includes water, a bird, a woman and an egg. The woman in this case is care. The egg is represented by the stone structures themselves which are held to be like womb-like edifices connected with the rebirth of the sun and the rising of the swan. What about the water? There are some interesting water features down along the Boyne below Newgrange, which are considered to be man-made. These circular ponds were deliberately, deliberately created, and their circular shape and structure has been interpreted by archaeology as significant with regard to their similarity with the henge structures. There are four ponds in total, um, uh, and uh, two of them in front of Newgrange are clay-lined and are conjoined. Whooper swans winter on freshwater lakes and marshes, and in Western Europe especially, on low agricultural land. They feed on shallow water, and although they can occasionally be found on, feed, on feeding arable land, less than 15% do so in winter. Their tendency towards freshwater habitats makes the Boyne floodplain the ideal wintering base for the whooper swans, something which may have been further aided by the artificial ponds which have, may have been created specifically for these birds. Now that is entirely my own speculation. It is clear that swans were held with great reverence, something which would have been accentuated by the apparent presence of a giant swan in the sky gliding down the Milky Way. It has been said that Cygnus is one of the few constellations which actually resembles the thing it is meant to represent. Quote, unquote, a rare thing among constellations. But this fact alone can hardly justify the creation of a vast sky ground system, such as the Newgrange Fornox harmonisation. What was the great significance of the Swan constellation in ancient Ireland, and why was so much effort made to create such an astronomical plan? The answer lies in precession of the equinoxes, the slow wobble of the Earth's axis first mentioned in chapter 3. And I'm still reading from Island of the Setting Sun in search of Ireland's ancient astronomers. And so I state that I, did, I didn't have any doubt that uh, the people who built Newgrange, Nowth and Douth were aware of the slow movement of precession of the equinoxes. Um and that uh, this is something that I read from I'm just going to find the reference here um, there's a very good book about precession of the equinoxes uh, it's called Hamlet's Mill and I made a, a video a while back about uh, uh, the connections between the precession of the equinoxes mentioned in Hamlet's Ill, Mill Hamlet's Mill and the ancient Irish astronomers. I'm going to post that in here as a comment. Hopefully you'll all see that. Don't watch it now. Watch it afterwards. Uh, but that's the link to the to the uh, the uh, YouTube video about Hamlet's Mill. So where was I? Yeah, so I don't doubt that they could perceive this over a distance of time. During the epoch in which Newgrange and Fornox were in use, <coughs> pardon me, the pole was marked by a star called Alpha Draconis, which has the proper name Thuban in modern astronomical use. It is the main star in the constellation Draco the Dragon. We remember that. The dragon constellation is woven into the Angus Care love story, in which we are told Angus finds his swan maiden at the lake of the dragon's mouth. Hanging above Cygnus in the sky, as it rises on the northern horizon, is the head of Draco. The romantic legend appears to divulge some primeval processional knowledge. 
The evidence that Irish Neolithic builders knew about procession is starkly and stunningly illustrated by the Fornox Passage Mount, which homes in on Denip, pardon me, the bright star of Cygnus and the 20th brightest star in the entire sky. At a key moment in the turning of the mill wheel of procession, for almost the entire 25,800 years, it's actually 25,920 years, of a single cycle of the procession of the equinoxes, Deneb is a circumpolar star as viewed from the latitude of Fornox. This means that it does not set below the horizon, that on, on any given night of the year, in any epoch of time, Deneb remains visible throughout the night. And at the moment, when it gets dark, here in Ireland, uh, in, in, in the immediate hours after darkness, if you look towards the northern horizon, you'll be able to see two bright stars very close to the horizon. The brighter one is Vega in the constellation of Lyra, the, the lyre or the harp, and the other one is Deneb, the tail uh, or bright star of Cygnus, the swan constellation. So Deneb remains visible throughout the night. But there is a brief term during this long cycle, i.e. procession, when Deneb glances the horizon in the north, appearing nightly to set momentarily behind whatever distant landmark features lie in that direction before rising off the earth again. This phenomenon probably lasted for just a couple of centuries before Deneb became circumpolar again. An observer inside the southern recess of Fornox, looking out through the passage, would have seen Deneb framed by the aperture of the entrance, rising slowly at a shallow angle off the distant hills and mountains. Because of the very slow rising and falling of Deneb over time, it is probable that astronomers in Fornox might have seen the star through the entrance for as long as a millennium or so. But despite the slow change in its position, it retains a huge significance in this construction because of the fact that it appeared to vanish for a short time below the horizon. The implication is that there is a very profound knowledge of procession and that this was encoded into the Angus Kerr love story. Another astronomical element of the Newgrange Fornox system is the fact that, at the time of winter solstice, the wings of the Swan constellation Cygnus appear to point downwards towards the position of the Sun below the horizon, albeit roughly. Thus, Cygnus could perhaps have been used to track the position of the Sun during the night preceding the winter solstice dawn. Towards daybreak, the Swan stars would vanish in the encroaching light from the Sun, and thus the Swan would announce the sunrise on the shortest day. This correlation of swan stars and sun is mimicked in a fashion inside Newgrange on winter solstice, when the, where the light from the sun shines into the heart of the cross-shaped chamber at dawn. Brendan Kinch says, one thing that always puzzles me is, for instance, are we talking about Cygnus at the moment? What evidence have we that this constellation had the same name, or name meaning swan, back at the time these structures were made? The simple answer to that, Brendan, is we don't have any evidence of that. Nowhere has it been written, you know, that Cygnus is the swan constellation. Nowhere in Irish myth does it explicitly say this myth pertains to this particular swan constellation. Uh, but if you look at the comparative studies in uh, not just mythology but in astronomical mythology, you find that quite often in various uh, disparate parts of the world that a constellation is considered uh, uh, as being the same uh, creature. Just the way in mythology as the same themes appear to recur. But you're absolutely right. We don't have the direct evidence of that. So we're speculating here that, you know, in prehistory uh, that the ast ancient astronomers saw Cygnus, uh, the same constellation that we do today, and uh, perceived it as a swan. The inference that Cygnus held a special importance to the stone builders can be further extrapolated from unique astronomical data subtly woven into the narrative of the vision of Angus. When Angus first found Care, she was with thrice fifty maidens linked together by a silver chain. And here I'm trying to build up a circumstantial case for what I'm saying, Brendan, so you understand. In one account, Care herself was adorned by a silver necklace. It is patently obvious that the silver chain is the Milky Way, which, as a matter of major significance, runs right through the Cygnus constellation in the sky. The giant swan of the heavens appears to be flying along the astral river. The Finns knew this sky river as Linonrata, meaning the bird's way. We have encountered this silver chain before in the chapter about Tara, where we were told that Lou of the Long Arm 
wore the Milky Way as a silver chain around his neck. The silver chain of the Milky Way connects Cygnus with another nearby constellation which has long been considered to represent a bird. That star grouping is called Aquila, the eagle, which contains the bright star Altair. The bird stars of Deneb and Altair are the 20th and 20, uh, and 20th and 13th brightest stars in the night sky, respectively. The location of the two bird, bird groupings, so close together in the sky with the Milky Way as a backdrop, suggests the idea that one constellation represented Angus and the other Care. The Milky Way, the most spectacular band of heaven, provides a resplendent backdrop for the great swan stars. The Milky Way was regarded by the Polynesians as the road of souls as they pass into the spirit world. How beautiful. In the Scottish Western Isles, people thought of the migrating whooper swans as, quote, carrying the souls of the dead to heaven, which lay north beyond the north wind, unquote. In the ancient Irish mindset, it was held as the road of the illuminated cow or the road of the white cow, Balach na Bófinna or Bóhar na Bófinna. It features very prominently in the study of procession for once the procession had been discovered, it is a reference point from which the procession could be imagined to have taken its start. Ancient monuments in Turkey dating back to circa 9.5 to 9000 BC expressed a shamanic worldview that reflected a far older cosmological mindset which saw Cygnus as the bird of creation atop the sky pole. This sky pole is the Milky Way along which Cygnus is flying. The authors of Hamlet's Mill infer that this was that this was when the vernal equinoctial sun left its position in the Milky Way in Gemini, or more precisely above the upraised hand of Orion, and that afterwards the notion transpired that the Milky Way might mark the abandoned track of the sun. Similarly, as is probably the case with the Irish astronomers, it was regarded as being the track of the moon, the road of the cow. Interestingly, the East African Turu envisioned the Milky Way as the cattle, ba- cattle track of the brother of the creator. Today, the huge ring of the Milky Way cannot be viewed as one complete circle. At most, we can see about two thirds of its bright bands, the rest remaining beyond view below the horizon. Of course, observing the Milky Way in the first place requires dark, unpolluted skies, something which rules out observation of it in the large, uh, in the centre of large modern cities and towns. In former times, before the Industrial Revolution and prior to the invention of the light bulb, observing the Milky Way would have been much easier in many parts of the world where it is today virtually impossible. It is best seen at the zenith, the point in the sky directly overhead, because its faint bands are harder to see when closer to the horizon. In the Neolithic, however, it would have been much easier to perceive. It is difficult to imagine, in this modern age, a time when the night sky would have held a luminous brilliance and a crisp clarity, the stars and planets and the bands of the Milky Way appearing more vivid and more dramatic than they do even in dark, unpolluted skies today. In modern times, sadly, Only in remote spots can one still glimpse the grandeur of the Milky Way. In this regard, we are jealous of the ancient stargazers and the sights that they beheld. And interesting in this regard is the fact that at the moment Deneb was uh, rising off the northern horizon and being viewed from the rear recess in Fornox out through the passageway, at that exact moment, that was the moment in the Neolithic when the Milky Way appeared as a bright ring of light all the way around the horizon, something that does not happen today because of precession of the equinoxes. So if I could very, very quickly uh, and simply, because I, I, I understand some of you may not be aware or familiar with the concepts. If you could imagine the Earth uh, is, is, you know, the Earth is on an axis, which it is, that axis is tilted. And we spoke yesterday about how that axis oscillates very slightly, which means that the sun's rising position positions at the solstices uh, oscillate also. Um, at the moment, they're inside the places where they were rising in the Neolithic. But further to that oscillation, there is a very slow wobble 
of the Earth's axis, which forms a circle in the pole of the sky over 26,000 years. This is called precession of the equinoxes. The main effect of that is that the sun's vernal point, and of course its solstice positions and its, its points at various times of the year, are regressing westwards through the zodiac very, very, very slowly. And they spend an average of 2100 years over just over two millennia in each constellation if you were to divide the constellations up neatly and of course they're uh, they're not um what would you say they're not divided equally equally in the modern mindset where we draw maps and we draw boundaries of constellations so thus for instance we are in the age of pisces defined by the fact that the solar position on the vernal equinox is in the constellation of pisces uh, we are soon to enter in the coming centuries the age of Aquarius, but prior to the age of Pisces, we were in, in the age of Aries, and prior to the age of Aries, we were in the age of Taurus, which I have speculated and suggested in my work could be uh, the reason for the proliferation of stories about the bull, which may refer to Taurus in Irish mythology. So the effects of this procession are that one thing is that uh, Deneb uh, was lower in the sky uh, in its uh, nightly rotation around the pole. It was lower in the sky in the Neolithic and scraped uh, the horizon and disappeared for a time and rose again. But as it was rising again, this amazing thing happened involving the Milky Way um, encompassing the whole horizon. Now, I wonder, in relation to the fact that the Milky Way was known in Irish as Balak na Bófina, or the Way of the White Cow, or Bóthar na Bófina, whether or not uh, that we can suggest that the Milky Way, uh, which is, uh, it was seen as a reflection or uh, the sky equivalent of the earthly uh, Milky Way River, which is the Awen Bófina, the River of the White Cow, which is the, the River Boyne that flows around the monuments. Was this the reason that Newgrange was built, or one of the many reasons that Newgrange was built on this promontory, on this uh, peninsula, as it were, uh, surrounded on three sides by the river? Because they were trying to sort of replicate this idea that Newgrange, at certain times of the night, at certain times of the year, was cir circled by this ring of light on the horizon, furthermore circled by this river, uh, which was uh, named, we think, in conjunction with the Milky Way. And perhaps, too, the uh, white quartz which adorned it, uh, spread around it, was supposed to replicate that Milky Way. But that is something that does not happen today. At no point today do we ever see uh, the entire Milky Way. Uh, so if I could just get this roll of masking tape. What you're imagining is that in, in the Neolithic, at certain times of the night, that the, the, the ring of the Milky Way flattened so that it was visible. Uh, uh, all the way around the horizon but that today that doesn't happen that the way that it rotates it never flattens out so at, at most you only ever see uh, two thirds of it maybe three no not not three quarters but you see a half to two thirds of it uh, and it never flattens like it did back then and i just wonder whether that wasn't uh, something that was enthralling and fascinating to the builders uh, of newgrange any which way you look at it it's very interesting and uh, uh, always worth bearing in mind that um, I'm not uh, trying uh, to um, uh, say that this is in any way definitive. This is an exploration of uh, Newgrange and its stories and its myths uh, in, in conjunction with astronomy, which I believe and many others believe to have been very important to the people who built it. The fact that it is illuminated by the sun on the shortest days of the year should at least indicate that. Marie Hughes says, thank you, Anthony, and your beautiful audience. Another wonderful day of learning. Let's talk about the bull again. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Because there's many, many, many bull stories to be told. If there are any questions, I'd be glad to take questions or comments to add them in before we finish. But in the meantime, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read to you uh, from uh, uh, George William Russell's Imaginations and Reveries, uh, uh, a, a collection of short stories written by A.E. Russell or George William Russell, uh, who was uh, an Irish writer, theosophist, um, visionary 
uh, someone who had a great respect for the mythology of the Tua de Danon. Uh, and this is a story that I think will, will, if you haven't heard it before, will make your spine tingle and will make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. Because it was written in 1897 and appears to describe the winter solstice illumination of the Chamber of Newgrange by the light of the sun at a time uh, when Newgrange had uh, not collapsed quite, but where the subsidence of the monument had resulted for a long, long time previously in the fact that the sun did not shine into the chamber for many, many centuries previous to that, and possibly for 4,000 years. Catherine Woodruff asks, would the river pass in Newgrange reflect the Milky Way? Yes, thus our physical world being a mere reflection of the heavenly spiritual reality. The stars, moon and swans become a guide for spirits coming and going. Just pondering with all of you. Well, that's exactly what I've been doing. Catherine is pondering these ideas. And yes, I absolutely agree with you. What we're looking at here is the idea of heaven's mirror as above, so below. And that uh, there was an effort made to connect heaven and earth uh, in a cosmology or a cosmic scheme uh, that tried to see or that absolutely did see that everything on earth was affected by the movements of the sky. In particularly, uh, in particular, the movements of the sun, which brought with it the growth season and the harvest and, of course, the death season and the, the barrenness and the coldness of the land during during the winter period. So, yes, absolutely. That's what we're looking at. So this is from George William Russell's A Dream of Angus Og, clearly inspired by the story Ashlinga Angus Og. Uh, but I think you'll agree a little bit different. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to read uh, the relevant part, which I think you'll agree is fabulous. Our brothers rejoice, said the shepherd to Con. Who are they? asked the boy. They are the thoughts of our father. May we, may we go in? Con asked, for he was fascinated by the melody, mystery and flashing lights. Not now. We are going to my home where I lived in the days past, when there came to me many kings and queens of ancient era, many heroes and beautiful women who longed for the druid wisdom we taught. And did you fight like Finn and carry spears as tall as trees and chase the deer through the woods and have feasting and singing? No, we, the Danans, did none of those things. But those who were weary of battle and to whom feast and song brought no pleasure, came to us and passed hence to a more wonderful land, a more immortal land than this. Pardon me. As he spoke, he paused before a great mound, grown over with trees, and around it silver clear in the moonlight, were the remains Sorry, were immense stones piled, the remains of an original circle, and there was a dark, low, narrow entrance leading within. He took Con by the hand, and in an instant they were standing in a lofty, cross-shaped cave, built roughly of huge stones. This was my palace. In days past, many a one plucked here the purple flower of magic, and the fruit of the tree of life. It is very dark, said the child disconsolately. He had expected something different. Nay, but look, you will see it is the palace of a god. And even as he spoke, a light began to glow and to pervade the cave and to obliterate the stone walls and the antique hieroglyphs engraved thereon and to melt the earthen floor into itself like a fiery sun suddenly uprisen within the world. And there was everywhere a wandering ecstasy of sound. Light and sound were one. Light had a voice, and the music hung glittering in the air. Look how the sun is dawning for us, ever dawning in the earth, in our hearts, with ever youthful and triumphant voices, your sun is but a smoky shadow, ours the ruddy and eternal glow. Yours is far away, ours is heart and hearth and home. Yours is a light without, ours a fire within. In rock, in river, in plain, everywhere living, everywhere dawning, whence also it cometh that the mountains emit their wondrous rays. 
As he spoke, he seemed to breathe the brilliance of that mystical sunlight and to dilate and tower so that the child looked up to a giant pillar of light, having in his heart a sun of ruddy gold which shed its blinding rays about him. And over his head there was a waving of fiery plumage and on his face an ecstasy of beauty and immortal youth. I am Angus Conherd. Men call me the young. I am the sunlight in the heart, the moonlight in the mind. I am the light at the end of every dream, the voice forever calling to come away. I am the desire beyond joy or tears. Come with me, come with me. I will make you immortal. For my palace opens into the gardens of the sun. And they, there are the fire fountains which quench the heart's desire in rapture. And in the child's dream he was in a palace high as the stars, with dazzling pillars jewelled like the dawn, all fashioned out of living and trembling opal. And upon their thrones sat the Danon gods, with their sceptres and diadems of rainbow light, and upon their faces infinite wisdom and imperishable youth. In the turmoil and growing chaos of his dream, he heard a voice crying out, You remember, Con, Con, Conor Amor, you remember. And an instant, in an instant he was torn from himself and had grown vaster and was with the immortals, seated upon their thrones, they looking upon him as a brother. And he was flying away with them into the heart of the gold when he awoke, the spirit of childhood dazzled with the vision which is too lofty for princes. Fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Man, if that doesn't lift you and set your heart racing and raise the the hairs on your arms and on the back of your neck and give you a tingling sensation in your throat, I don't know what will. And there I propose to conclude today's webcast about Ashlinga Ingeso, the dream vision of Ingesog. And to hope that we can continue to cherish and hold dear in our hearts these ancient stories with which we are through which we are gaining much strength and resolve right now uh, to bring us through the current situation in the world. And I wish you all a very, very enjoyable Friday, no matter where you are in the world, and a very peaceful and enjoyable one. May you stay sa safe and healthy. May the deities of the Tua Dit Danon come to your side and give you succour and relief. Uh, and may you have a wonderful weekend we'll be back tomorrow with another story uh, i'm not sure exactly what we'll be talking about just yet but i'm glad that you're enjoying yourselves and this certainly has been enjoyable for me i wish you all the best from here in the boyne valley not far from the ancient river of the white cow uh, the the earthly version of balach na thank you indeed to one and all <laughs>